Coming up, Rhino finally rode Hagrid's, and boy, was it an ordeal. We will get there uh, in our actual full review of Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure, and then also another house has been announced for Halloween Horror Nights 29, Yeti Terror of the Yukon. You can't believe it was happening. Yep, terrible. Okay, from the Bob Varley Studio in Orlando, Florida, this is the Universal Edition of the Dis Unplugged. This is episode 224 of the Dis Unplugged Universal Edition. The Dis Unplugged Universal Edition is brought to you by Dreams Unlimited Travel, experts at helping you plan the perfect universal vacation. Visit them on the web at www.dreamsunlimitedtravel.com. The Dis Unplugged Universal Edition is also brought to you by Disboards.com. If you're looking for even more information to help you plan your universal Orlando vacation, head over to Disboards.com and join the discussion today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Dis Unplugged Universal Edition. I am your host, Craig Williams. Today, I am joined alongside by my co-host, Mr. Ryan the Rhino Clavin. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Oh, anytime. Anytime, indeed. So, uh, we have... What? Did you see, first of all, I know we don't really do housekeeping, but I just this feels like an appropriate place to bring it up. Did you see that we have had our first submission of theme music? I did, yes. Yeah. We got uh, one from Brenton. So yeah, All the way from Australia. Yeah, so uh, thank you for, for bringing that up. Uh, I don't believe for this episode I have enough time to uh, work through it all yet, and I know Brenton wrote in his email uh, that if we, if we liked the style of it, that he would add full orchestration to it and <laughs> stuff. Uh, so I, I did listen quickly, but it was wasn't like it was literally as i was rolling out of bed and then i forgot to go back to it so uh that's really me sitting here saying i don't care like that's what it's coming off as i do care um i'm gonna give it the actual proper time it needs brenton and uh we will we will uh definitely be in touch with you because i i like the vibe it was a it was kind of it was a, cool yeah I, I like i was like oh i don't i don't know what i expected but i'm like yeah. you know it was almost a little too cool for us like I, it, that's what i thought too i was <laughs> like oh this this feels like a waste to yeah. use this on our theme song like it, it well yeah no it, it was really good it was like it was it, it had an excitement to it that I just feel like neither one of us bring to yeah. the show at any point in time. But uh, Brenton has now stepped up to the plate. He has set the level. It's now time for y'all to do it, too. I don't know what metaphor I was going for there. What analogy? I don't know what I was going for. What's that instrument that you push the colored buttons and it makes the... the like like a MIDI machine? Like kind of... Uh, uh, yeah, like a synth or like, uh, something like well, that. Well, I mean, there's, a lot, there's there are synthesizers. Yeah. There's drum machines uh, way back in the day, the MIDI keyboards. I, I mean, mean, I had my Casio keyboard. I, Let's not get ourselves. So I'm, what you're telling me is you want someone to basically recreate the band section from Revenge of the Nerds. Yes, but yeah. okay. dressed exactly the same as well <laughs> while they're doing it. I will accept no less than that. Oh, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. So, very good. Okay. I want it to be like the <laughs> opening of uh, Mr. Roboto by The Sticks. <laughs> Not The Sticks, by Sticks. Yeah. That was rude. Okay, <laughs> we're, we're going downhill here, so we should probably get to it. Uh, like I said uh, in that cold open there, we do have our review of Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure, and that's coming up for you just in a couple seconds. But uh, we are just going to briefly talk right now about the latest Halloween Horror Nights house announcement. Yes, we have a another original house being announced for the event, and this one is an exciting one. It is Yeti Terror of the Yukon. Potatoes. Potatoes. <laughs> uh, the, one of the first things I saw on Twitter uh, after this announcement, and I feel terrible every time I bring stuff up I see, and uh, then I don't give anyone proper credit, but someone else, if you search the keywords, I'm sure you can find it, but they're like, oh, you know, it's, it's good that we're saying that a mythical creature that clearly has its roots based in the the Himalayas and Asia yeah, is I saw now this from this the Yukon. Yeah, I was like, oh. <laughs> but but, but. It, actually in the description, it it covers that it, right it, away yeah. it does cover that but it's like uh, uh, a little bit of a stretch i don't know if i can actually believe now that these are real yetis well they're they're i think they're related to the swamp yeti 
They, well, okay. Well, do we want to just dive right into yeah, it? Yeah, I think okay. we should. Yeah. Yeah, let's dive right into it. So uh, basically, last year, Rhino just mentioned Swamp Yetis. You could find the Swamp Yeti during the attack of the Swamp Yeti scene that was in Slaughter Cinema, the house that was uh, a salute to all these fake movies that that universal came up with and you know we we pumped up the swamp yeti uh, going into the event and then saw it and anytime i had the chance to see a swamp yeti in that house i was always overly excited so i like i like when there's actually uh, scares that are actually taller than me because that mm. doesn't happen very often uh, when you think of the swamp yeti i think you should think of um harry and the hendersons like yeah, that's he, a great he, description. He, he, that's who it was, you yeah. know, basically. Only less friendly of a face. Yeah. So, uh, no John Lithgow. Uh, yeah, uh, but of course. So, we'll talk about that later on our John Lithgow podcast. Oh, God, podcast. I wish. I wish. <laughs> it's just a we'll third see. rock from the sun yeah. podcast oh now this is actually a good idea yep. <laughs> we'll, we'll save that one for later there but uh yeah so we saw the swamp yeti last year and now the yeti is coming back this year in a new house and it's a different style of yeti as rhino uh rhino uh, alluded to there so would you like me to read the story yeah okay so, deep in the remote tundra of the Yukon, loggers and trackers Ooh. seek refuge from the frigid grip of an Arctic blizzard. But out in the darkness, a terror lurks far more dangerous than the deluge of snow and ice. These unfortunate souls have intruded into a territory that is haunted by their worst nightmares. Enter a logging camp that's been torn apart, floors caked with snow bones and gore right outside screams are frozen on the faces of those who fled the towering monsters only to succumb to the elements but there is no escape from beasts as brutal as the winter it's cold <sighs> so basically uh from uh, the other descriptions that Universal released on their site, uh, it's that the house will kind of place you in a labyrinth of caves uh, that is like complete. I believe you'll start off by like getting getting ready to enter these caves, or we'll see it at some point in time. But they said there's even a trail of blood leading into them. Mm. Spooky um, screams will echo throughout the icy tunnels for those who couldn't escape those yetis, and along the way we'll find the remains, of course, of those who came before us, and uh, we're probably gonna suffer for the exact same outcome, whether it's the Yetis or the cold that gets us. But death, uh, <laughs> yes. death baby, yeah. Uh, I'm excited about this because, like I just said uh, before, I love when the the actual creatures in these houses are taller than me because it actually does make me feel feel like small, at least for once in, in that sense. I know that's very straightforward there, but um, I think you get what I say. It's like if, if you're probably a five foot girl, you're probably terrified when there's like a six foot person over top of you on a normal day. So uh, it's it sets up a high bar for me when I'm when I'm standing tall, six, three, six, four. I walked around with somebody that was six, ten yesterday. Yeah. And I thought he was going to pick me up at some point. Oh, no, no, I, I agree. So I was with him the day before and I was like, wow. It's like this guy's got to be seven feet because I was like he's a foot. But then he said six ten. I'm like, yep, exactly one foot taller than me. Yep, 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 yep. So uh, I the the height obviously is a is scary aspect of it. And then we're getting a cold house. You know how much I love cold oh, houses. That's that's when they announced this. I was like, no, I don't even care what the story is. Don't even need to read it because you know what? I'm gonna be soaking wet, sweating, and that'll be the house you go in to cool off. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know. Like. Um, God, why do I always suck with this? One of the HHN devoted sites, uh, they already released their their uh, their expected houses map a little while back, and I don't remember they had Yetis on there. I don't remember where they put it, but based on the fact that this is uh, the the style of this house, I would assume it's probably going to be in a sound stage. And well, I, I'm assuming it's going to be like. Do you remember that house a couple of years ago where it snowed, where it was like the hospital that you were going into well, or something? I'm yeah. assuming that's what the entrance will be similar to. I, my guess is like where Poltergeist was, but I mean, I guess that's a huge area. So, and this seems like a small, yeah, but small little story. But no, remember they can always. There's multiple houses that can go in those areas. And a couple of years ago, we had um uh, uh the Blood Gulch. 
in, yeah, in there true. as well too. So um, they they can they can easily make original stuff happen. They had the uh, Bayou of Blood in there as well. Uh, Blood. So it's they can always make that happen. I would just in you know it's it, usually they always do these snowy ones in the soundstage. Whether it's the one you mentioned, um, I believe the first Nightingales, if I remember, had a snow effect to it. Um, and oh, then, uh, and then um, uh, for, uh, the Christmas one, the. Oh, yeah, Krampus. Yeah, had a yeah. snow scene and so yep. The Shining. Yep, and yeah. then also even then way back to The Thing, if you were there for the year. No, I didn't. Not the I original thing. see The Thing, the, yeah. The Mary Elizabeth Winstead, The Thing. Winstead. The Winstead. So uh, and, uh, if we just went all up on that and then someone sends me a message saying, uh, no, they posted that it was going to be in, a, in one of the tents, then I apologize, but I'm just doing basic math here. And I did go to school at first to become an engineer. Mm -mm. (laughs) yep 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 but now i'm doing this uh we'll go into that later not on this podcast different one one about my life and about engineers one one about my life failures engineers those who are podcasts solely devoted to the alien prequel movies about the engineers that michael fassbender if that wasn't niche enough for you i don't have anything else yep i don't either so uh yep very excited for this one i don't have anything else to say about it i do well, okay. no, I do. In the houses in general. So this marks the fifth house they've announced. So we have the Yeti. We have uh, Universal things. Monsters, Stranger Things. Um, Nightingale's Blood Pit. And Depths of Fear. Depths of Fear. So a lot of original houses, I feel like. I mean, I guess two IPs, right? But it's so ten houses all together. Um, can you? Can I? Well, I know you don't like to do this. But what? I'm... I, so you said there's another site that makes a guess about what it is. And I was thinking like, oh, well, they had the Yeti costume from the Swamp Yeti. So I wonder... But my thing is, like, I've just been thinking, like, do you think that we'll get... I don't know. I guess you can't really make this thing. But I was thinking about uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Do you think that would still be a hope that that could happen? I believe that is still... I... I, ba- I, I based have- it on a rumor as in like Trick or Treat the one year did really well in its scare zone and then they turned it into a house and then a scare zone again. And so I I feel like the most um, popular ha- scare zone I've seen since then has been Killer Clowns from Outer Space. And also when you watch the movie, it seems pretty set up to be a haunted house at some point, you know, in a big clown yeah. tent and all that stuff. So. Oh, okay. So I... I found the speculation map that is um, that uh, is out there. I don't remember which one this was, but uh, it's one of the one of the first ones out there. I don't know if it's it's been kind of changed up at this point, but um, also on this speculation map, and I, I God, who the freak? I wish I could find out who is the creator of this map. My thing is, when people make these guessing maps, how do they guess the original property? Well, uh, well, I believe it's because they have insight from people who are working on it or helping them. So uh, this is the last... God, I I feel terrible. It's... But um, I'm I'm just... I'm not going to keep stuttering over this. So yeah, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, of course, is still uh, still expected to be one of the houses, too. Um, They... They did have Yeti as one of them that did come true. Uh, the first one they posted or the second map they posted uh, had just a ghost for one, leading many people to think Ghostbusters. And uh, Rhino and I have also heard some heard extra rumor, yeah. rumors kind of swirling that would also lead to uh, us believing would that. would die. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the other ones that they kind of have in here are... Uh, Tooth Fairy, that was one of the ones they named. Another one called Graveyard and one for House of a Thousand Corpses. But you should know on here it's called Appalachian Yeti. So they yeah. so clearly this isn't 100% correct. I'm not going to lie. Okay, so and then somebody, it was just a random Twitter person, I don't know, said something about this being like the 80s theme again. And I'm like, I don't think that's announced either. I, I don't think they've announced like a theme yet. They Am did. I wrong? No, they did. They when did? they when all the tickets went on sale, they said that it would return back as 80s. Oh, okay. All right. Cuz on this guest map is that House of a Thousand Corpses. That does that movie take place in the 80s? I don't know. I've never seen it. I Rob Zombie movies make me so uncomfortable. Um I guess that's the point, but I I'm not going to lie. 
the rest of that lineup does not have me super excited. So I do hope that's not 100% true. But I never know. You know how I always feel about the original stuff. And then once I'm there in the moment, I end up loving it. Like yeah. the, the Scary Tales one was one of my favorite ones. Like, and I still think about that one, you know. Yeah. No, nope, I, I completely agree with you on that. So uh, we'll uh, hopefully we'll be able to lock down this more and we'll talk about all of it in the future here uh, coming up to it. But I'm not I'm not going to keep on that because we have to get on Hagrid's and that's the most important thing about today. So uh, moving on our review of Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure. So uh, we're going to break this down, I guess, basically into two sections. The first one is going to be uh, our our thoughts on the actual attraction. Uh, everything that goes with it, the queue and the ride itself. But then we are going to break down the second part of the review of our actual experience because we have we have had a, a terrible experience with it like many others out there. So I want to be as fair as possible to the ride while still, uh, you know, while still being balanced overall on this. So uh, I've shared my thoughts on the ride. I'll get Rhino's on it right now. Rhino, go. So for me, there's no question. The ride is fantastic. It's not, it's, it's, it's something when everything is all figured out and calmed down that I will, I can't see myself going to the park and not getting on this, this thing. You know, mm-hmm. what I love about it is it just, it's when you're on the attraction, your line of sight, you kind of only see the attraction. You are in this forest. This whole time I was like, oh, I actually did feel like I'm in the forest. And when you're looking at it from the outside, you might not, it might not seem like that when you're, you, you'll be like, oh, this is an oppressive um, landscape that they have here. But then it looks completely different when you're actually sitting on the motorcycle and riding the attraction. I enjoyed all of the animatronics and the effects that go into it. I forgot about the drop until like right before it happened. I thought that was a lot of fun. Um, I forgot about the spike until right when we started to turn upward. And like when we sat on the motorcycle, Craig and I sat in the last seat on the bike. And then our friends that we were with sat in the first seat on the bike behind us. And he was like, oh, if we'd only waited a second, we could have been the first. I'm like, no, 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 it'll be fine. And I am honestly really happy we were in the back because... When it went up the spike, I was like, sweet baby Jesus, they are really high up there. And I am afraid of heights. So that that part might be a I have to work up to it scenario. But um, I we looked out. I felt like the attraction all ran smoothly for us. I thought it, it looked beautiful. I It's a long attraction. I don't feel like if I had waited four hours on the first day, I don't think I would have left unhappy having Mm -hmm. ridden it and then walked away. Am I telling you to wait four hours for this attraction? No, but I'm just saying, you know, it's new and you're a diehard Harry Potter fan. I would, I would say like, Oh, my, my original anticipated wait time would have been worth it. But I, I mean, I, I know you have had the issues you've said with it. I don't, I I get what you're saying. And I, and I, and I, when you say it, I'm like, Oh yeah, I kind of wish they did do this stuff, but I haven't seen it like that yet. So I, for me, it still was like, Honestly, I can't really think of anything I would change about it. Yeah, no, I I genuinely, the stuff that I have is truly nitpicking. Like some of the issues with the the blast ended scroot not not being, it's, it's a great animatronic. I just don't like that you can see the arm that it's yeah. sticking up and on I, and moving. I did see that when I was on the attraction without you even pointing it out, but I didn't really think anything yeah. of it. I, I like even had a conscious thought where I was like, oh, I can see that thing's pull. And yeah. I was like... But I didn't. I I wasn't later like, oh, they should do this. But then you suggested putting like boxes right around yeah. that area, and I was like, oh yeah, that's kind of a simple fix. Yeah, it's. I I saw stuff like that. Like I I went on and on about in my video about how the trees like it is. It's not a true forest right now, no. but we know it's going to transform into one over time. So it's going to be awesome to watch it. the The ride itself, I still think, is just a great blend of thrilling moments but then also those couple moments to breathe where yeah you, you do have that time to like relax in between the next bit of excitement yeah i like that it wasn't non-stop like the motorcycle goes and that's it for the entire thing you know and you've sped through this whole, whole thing but i also really enjoy the actual vehicle as well i i have only ridden on the motorcycle so far but you know that you hold on to the handles you kind of lean forward a little bit but there's a lap bar that pushes down on you and it was weird because there are parts where it like turns so much that I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we only have like seat lap bars right now. Like, and that's cool. But also as somebody who has been 
you know, afraid to go on. Like, I'm never going to go on Rip Ride Rocket. I just don't. It doesn't look appealing to me. I don't like being that high up and that sort of thing. But this is so like it feels like I'm just flying. It literally feels like I'm flying in this bike, but just high enough where I'm like, oh, I'm scared, but not too high where I'm like, bah, if I fell out, I might live. <laughs> like, I don't think you're going to fall. No, I don't think anybody will ever fall out of this attraction. Don't please. Oh, for the love of God, I hope yeah. that never happens. But, you know, like. I I just it's one of those it's just the right type of scary and thrilling for me. Yeah, no, it's definitely family friendly. I feel like it absolutely delivered on that. Uh, it's I I think in terms of a roller coaster, it's you know it, it would be a very thrilling first roller coaster um, at forty eight inches for the height requirement. I feel like your kids probably already done a couple of the other roller coasters like at, at at Disney and you know even stuff like Woody Woodpeckers and Flight of the Hippogriff at, at Universal. So I, I feel like there's obvious steps to getting to it. But uh, if if this is now considered like a a first, you know, a first real well, coaster. I mean, I guess, I, I guess uh, they say family, right? They describe yeah. it as a family coaster. Yeah. I, I when I think of the description, I feel like when I rode Slinky Dog at Universal Studio, uh, Universal Studios, Hollywood, at Hollywood Studios. I I thought, okay, yeah, this is a family coaster. You know, yeah. like yes, it's really high in the air at some points, but it's very basic. It's just kind of a circular track. You know, it does some fun things in there, but this is kind of. I I don't think it's like too much. It might not be too. I mean, it might be like wow, that went so fast or anything like that. But it does feel like this is. It tells a really cool, exciting story that you can kind of get lost in with the thrills. Yeah, and and that's what I needed when I was younger in order to get myself onto a ride. Yeah. And it definitely is that step up. It's beyond Slinky Dog. It is beyond. Hundred yeah, percent. It is beyond um, uh, Big Thunder Mountain railroad in that regards too so it it is that next evolution in terms of like family style coasters but i feel like a coaster like this uh you know maybe if you would have ridden it when you were younger you would have got that that taste for wanting to do bigger and it's a gateway coaster yeah (laughs) i mean kind of in a way i i feel like it could because it offers not really so much uh thrills in terms of like big hills and dives and stuff but it does with the twisting and turning and the speed launches i feel like it it gives you that taste like i want to do something bigger and better now and it's incredibly smooth i want to say that too like it's not like oh i was thrown to the side thrown to the other side so it's not about the the what's great about the type of thrills is it's not about the ex- the extremeness of those thrills it's about like it's just about that excitement where you're like oh i'm going sideways around this bend and now i'm looping down toward the water and now i'm coming back up like through this archway and it's it's it it literally does feel like you are riding in this motorcycle with hagrid like if you watch the movie i'm like oh this feels like what i imagine it felt like in the movie so we spent a lot of time oh, and i did I should feel like one. Sorry, one okay, last thing. Go. One last thing. Um, because I do want to address the motion sickness factor on this too. Mm-hmm. Because that when you do go up the spire, you go backwards, and you do go backwards for quite a bit. Um, and the the only thing I can think to compare it to is how you go backwards in Ever- on Mount Everest at um, Expedition Animal Kingdom Everest. Expedition Everest. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I would say that Expedition Everest makes me feel a little more nauseous going backwards than this does, but it does go backwards for an extended time. So if that does even trigger a little bit of it for you, like I did start to feel a little bit dizzy, but I was in the back. So yeah, I don't know that it'll feel different. I, it might feel a lot different in the front. You know? Well, that's that is part of it. So you're going to feel a little bit different. I mean, if you ever have an issue with motion sickness, on a roller coaster, I'd at least just from my time riding roller coasters, I'd say just go for a middle row because usually that's the most mm. complete uh, experience that you can have unless it's a situation like a, a roller coaster like Hulk or how Dragon Challenge was for me. I needed the front row because I needed to see where I was going because that that helped me deal with the motion sickness a yeah. little bit more. Uh, but but in general, on, on like Hagrid's, every time I've ridden in the middle, I felt like for the backwards portion that, that in the middle, it felt pretty much just like it, it felt like it did going forward. But you're right. When you are at the very back or yeah. if you're at the very front, it's, it's an odd sensation. 
yeah. with the background. Same as, and like you said, same as Expedition Everest. It's just, it's a brief moment of just feeling a little off because you really don't know where you're going. Well, until and that's, you ride that's the it part enough. too. I think if you've ridden it more and you yeah. know where you're going this time, that's part of it's your brain's trying to turn yeah. your cell body around. And if you can't do that, that's what makes yeah. me dizzy sometimes. Uh, exactly. Like on Everest, you, you get to the point where you start to remember like, okay, starting going down and then I'm going to have that one where I feel like I'm pushed down yeah. into my seat. You just kind of, you're, it's muscle memory, yeah. essentially. So uh, we spent a lot of time in the queue. What do you think of the queue? <laughs> um, I, I I don't really remember the queue as it was before. So for me, I think it I, I I think this entire area as a whole beautifully fits into the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Um, I think it's really it. I know people love dragon challenge and i i know that holds a special place in your heart and everything like that but for me this is much more fitting of this world and this land mm-hmm. and i think it adds so much visually to the to the area that that wasn't there before but not in a way where it was like oh we had this one eyesore but i just i feel like it's really opened up that world and so i feel like they i love the look of the building where it looks like ruins and i enjoy going into the queue, there is not a lot going on, so I don't want to be stuck in that queue for as long as we were ever again. And I was thinking about, you, I know you brought this up before, but um, the the video that you watch, the, the pre-show, um, is fun and it's cool, but it, it feels like you. I watched it so far before we were on the attraction. And it makes no sense to me, like, why that wouldn't be how, like, when you go to Gringotts, you wait in a line, and then you get in, you watch this queue inside of, uh, uh, not Bill's office, but it's the, the yeah, somebody's it is. office. It's the in head, head goblins, Bill right? Is yeah. it his office? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, it's, it's you're in there, and then you kind of go in, and you have a little bit more of a wait on the other side. But I would say Bill's office is, like, right in the middle, you know? And and even oh, more a, it, more toward the actual loading thing. It, this it, one is the opposite. It's way early. Yeah, this is the only pre-show that is not in the. I mean, think about any any single pre-show from from Universal and Disney. The only one I would guess you could kind of give a a pass on is Men in Black with how they handle um, you know, how they handle the going into the thing and then everything follows but that's not yeah. a true pre-show if you're yeah thinking, i was gonna say that's more like an yeah. a 30 second intro or yeah something. if you are thinking in the level of of gringotts or dinosaur or how old test track was any of these sh- attractions with a, an actual pre-show it happens you wait in the line and then you do the pre-show and then you have at most like another 20 minutes yeah. that's kind of like then that's like just it's pumping it could be you up faster, for the ride, it could you know? be less. Yeah. Um this one is essentially set up that you will be outside for about an hour, an hour and a half, depending on how busy it is. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could end up walking right into it yeah. if it's if it's slow enough. But when it's really busy right now and the ride is not cooperating, you know, you're spending an hour and a half waiting outside, going into a pre-show, which we were about half we were maybe entering in halfway through our group of the amount of yeah. people they ended up putting in and by the time we got into the pre-show i know because i've seen the pre-show from start to finish with no interruptions we missed half of the pre-show well, you just you walk in and i'm like oh there's uh there's these two characters up here yeah. i don't know if we're talking about who they are or not yeah but it's hagrid and arthur okay yeah so i you know and they're like doing something with a motorcycle already and i'm like oh I've missed something like, yeah. and the problem is because they're still loading the people in and the doors open, the effect doesn't really take hold yet. And then also it's like, I can't hear what they're saying yeah. because people are so loud about being put into a room that it's just like, what is the story? I I've missed the story about why they're multiplying the bikes and where this all came about. So, it, but the other crazy part about this is that no matter how, Let's say this it's dead at Universal and, you know, this ride's going to have a 20-minute wait. You're still going to be waiting in the sun. The, the queue leading up to where you go in that room can probably hold, like, less than 100 people, mm-hmm. right? Like, once mm-hmm. you enter the doorway into – because you wrap yeah. around in that room and then you go right into the room. And yeah. that's where I'm – that's the part that's kind of crazy to me is because it, it feels like – 
you could have put this in that other room over there. You know, I, I don't know how it was with Dragon Challenge or anything like that, but I, I just, I feel like if you built a room off to the side that could have a pre-show, you could have built this anywhere along the way. Well, that's the issue. This was a smart place for it. This is the area where the champion's tent used to be. When you first would walk in, like you would walk up the through the ruins. There, right? uh, the egg, well, no, the eggs were in the room that now looks like a big giant kitchen. Um, oh, okay. This is where the Goblet of Fire was. Oh, oh, oh and, okay. And this area and so you would walk in and you looped around and then you went down around the, the next round circular hallway that you were just mentioning there and that's where the uh, tri wizard cup was so it makes sense why they put it here because it was a big area that allowed for this type of, of space it just it just doesn't it's too it's way too early in the yeah. attraction it needs to be at the end because now like in our circumstance, because we were having technical issues and stuff, uh, it was kind of we waited about an out, like I said, an hour and a half outside, went through the pre-show. And then we were about three hours on the inside, four hours. We should have been three hours. And then it was it quickly kept up to like four and a half hours, I think, when it was all said and done. I mean, the first day that we tried to get on, it was six hours from start to finish. So um, it was a freaking mess. But uh, yeah, it's just in any circumstance, it's it's way too early where it is because if it gets backed up because they can only fit so many people in the room, mm -hmm. they have to then start a line outside to wait to get people inside this room. And then it's just it's not it's not smart. Um, I and it, it feels it feels like it's just kind of. It's not treating the pre-show the way it should deserves to be treated. It's part of the experience. It's part of the story. And it feels like it's just another thing. But they pack in the pre-show so full of people that you can't even hear anything unless you're right up against it. Like, you legitimately. Yeah. I know they didn't hear anything. They saw the characters. They they got – they you got a glimpse of it. And that was, that was about it. It was just – it was a terrible experience in the pre-show environment. And the last thing I'll kind of say leading into this right now – Express doesn't enter in the attraction until you're down in like Hagrid's kind of office area where his gloves are. And that's about in terms of waiting time, it's give or take 20 to 30 minutes before you get to the end of the line. So a good place to put in for Express. Um, and, and right now Express is AAP passes and any of the red cards that they're giving out if you've been uh, kicked what out of pass? line inconvenience. Ruby pass. No, no, what? no. What'd you just call it? An AAP. Oh, oh, okay. Attractions okay. Assistant sorry, pass. sorry. I just heard P pass, and I was yeah. like, "What's a P pass?" And, and uh, an attractions assistant pass. You know, like uh, if you have yeah, a yeah, yeah, disability yeah. or anything. For anyone out there who doesn't know what I'm talking about, um, if you have one of those passes, or if you have the Ruby pass that you get because you got kicked out of line or evac'd or or one of the issues with it, those are the only, from what I know, unless I'm being mistold, maybe VIP tours as well. Even then, I think they probably get put in earlier uh, or later on into the attraction. Uh, closer to the actual loading but those are the only two people going through the express right now if we're to assume that this is where express is going to be eventually one day when they do allow express um it's in terms of how far past the pre-show you are in the queue i mean it's you are closer you uh, i break up after the pre-show i break the queue up into thirds the first two rooms that you go into, I would say that's the first third. And then the caves into um, the, the caves and then like right before Hagrid's office, that's the second third. And then Hagrid's office to the ride is like the last third. Mm -hmm. So the pre-show is already two thirds past you, or before you. There's there's no way unless they are coming up with a new concoction for how to get express people into the pre-show and then also get them closer to the attraction there's there's no physical way to do that so basically if when they finally have express one day if they keep them loading into this place no one who does express is ever going to watch the pre-show it's just not and like i said unless yeah. they change where you go in for express like if they have the where the single rider staircase or where the express staircase used to be in dragon challenge if they can open up that stairway lead people down in that way Maybe they can do it, but you'd I, like but. then you'd then you have to like go through and weed out. It has to be weeded out 
after the show, though, right? Well, they would have to only load shows with only Express, and yeah. then that also makes no sense. Or they would have to do two queues, one with Express, you know, kind of like break Keep it off. Separated and do in like, there, yeah. Uh, yeah, and maybe they have plans to do that one day. Regardless, right now, if it looks like they're not, it just based on appearances, it looks like they're not going to change that. If they don't, that's right there. In my opinion, that's Universal saying, well, the pre-show doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to this experience. The pre-show doesn't matter. So right now with this pre-show kind of causing these little congestions with outdoors, at least um, I know what was happening for us is it was, they were waiting basically before they would load a pre-show, they were waiting for the first room after the pre-show to be completely clear, which that was keeping people standing outside for an extra 20 minutes when if the pre-show wasn't happening at all, it could have been just one continuous line yeah. moving into the castle or moving into the ruins. So I think they need to just drop the pre-show. It's not worth it. It doesn't set un- up anything for the story. It's it's just a mess. If you're So people are only seeing half the pre-show or they can't hear any of it. It just doesn't need to exist. Just it's a, sh- well, it's it. a shame. It is. It's a shame that they put it in there and they, you know, they wanted to to set it up in that way. It just doesn't work. And I think they should just close off that door and pretend it's not there until maybe later on when it's not busy anymore and they can get away with it. And I know it has after we went and experienced it the first uh, last couple of days from what I've been seeing people post wait times. They're talking about only waiting 90 minutes, less than that in some circumstances, oh, two hours. So the ride apparently already after we went on it is is starting Great. to do a lot better. <laughs> but but it's still not. I, I think. I think they need to just scrap the pre-show. Mm. That's just me. And that kind of, I already mentioned the fact we waited six hours for it. We did it because Rhino really needed to do it so we could actually talk about it. And we were, we, we had to put in and you know what we can't actually, I, it's not fair to just give you my experience of it as, as I was a guest of the media and stuff. I only waited like 30 minutes each time I got on the attraction. I can't really, I, I can speak to how great the ride is. I can't tell you how the experience overall with the queue and waiting is without actually putting in the wait. And this was a freaking nightmare. Yeah, it, it, the problem was it w- it wasn't even until it was it was the last part of that wait too. Like the first three hours, whatever we knew what we signed up for. It said yeah. 180 minutes when we got in line, and we had our apps out. We're connected to the internet. We're checking the app all the time, checking the updates whenever it says delayed. But then it would say 180 minutes, 180 minutes. It said 180 minutes for almost the entire time we waited. It was we got to four hours, and it still said 180 minutes. And I was like. Okay, well, that's clearly not true anymore. And then we got into this, like, the room basically right before you're about to get loaded into the attraction, like the last part of the queue that you go through. And it's that's where we just stopped moving for hours. For out, like, we were in there for at least two hours. And the thing that kind of bugged me about that is like the, you could get out of line and they would give you a ticket and you would go to use the restroom or you could like grab something and bring it back with you. You know, we, I had to go out and get bottles of water at one point and everything, but there was no, I, when I went outside, right when we were finally giving up, there was like seven managers out front of the attraction talking to people who haven't waited for even a moment of time on this, this ride, you know, out there telling people like the attraction, the line has been closed and all this stuff. Not a single one of them was inside talking to anybody that had been waiting in that queue for hours. You know what I mean? And that's the kind of thing. Like when I saw that, I started to get really annoyed. And because, you know, having worked in attractions, you know what it's like to have a manager that just doesn't want to deal with anything because they'd rather have a guest yell at the frontline cast member or something. And, and there's nothing we can do for it, you know? And I will say the cast members that we did encounter inside were very pleasant. Team members, I'm sorry. Um, team members are very pleasant. I think one girl's name was maybe Samantha. I don't know. But um, they overall were very nice. And I, I even said, I'm very understanding of this situation because I'm sure people are yelling at you, but you didn't build this ride. You didn't make these rules. You are here to follow the rules that are put in place. you know. And it's unfortunate for you that all of your leadership team is outside. Yeah. So the issue, that being said now, the issue is that we went on a day where there was no weather issues at all we uh basically we knew which days we were looking at going and when we when it looked at a forecast and said nope no weather at all figured that's the day right now the attraction has had issues because it was going down for weather and then trying to bring it back up and coming up and then hitting a technical glitch that's what was causing a lot of the weights 
So we were like, okay, well, let's pick a day where there's no bad weather and see how it goes. And all of the issues, all of the delays that caused us to wait longer and longer were always technical. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the when the first time it went down, we were still outside. So we could see that it was down. It did. It didn't. We didn't need cue spiels telling us like, "Oh, the attraction yeah. isn't running." I mean, it was nice when we finally got one because it said it could be up to an hour. And, and, I was like, and okay, the that's... spiels said different times yes. sometimes too, which was nice. That yeah. I'm like, "Oh, they've got a spiel. They're being pretty honest yeah. about how long it's exactly. going to add on to it." But when we're outside and we can clearly see it's not running, or it, at one point we saw it, but it just couldn't launch. They weren't launching. Yeah, they just kept like, rolling. Yeah, <laughs> um, we knew it's like, okay, this is going to be a while. And expectations. Once we got inside, the first two times, I believe, it actually broke down when we were inside, there was no spiels at all. We could The only reason we could tell when it started working again and that it did stop, first we could tell it stopped because we just completely stopped. Like 100% full stop for like 30 minutes in one place. And then we'd start moving again. And then it's like, okay, it must be fixed. And that happened a couple of times. And then... You hit another point where finally the spiels came on again and they're saying, okay, well, it could be up to 45 minutes. And that one cleared out and we're fine. So a little extra time added on, no problem. And then we get to the final room like Rhino talked about that we were in for two hours. That's when it started off again with the spiel saying it will be up to 45 minutes. And then once yeah, it every past like the 15 hour, to 20 minutes, they'd be like, it could be an additional 45 minutes. They played it three times and we're like, yeah. is it from the time you've just played it? Or is it from the original recording, you know? Yeah. And so essentially, and then it just hit a point where they were no longer spieling at at all. all. No, no automatic spiels, no spiels from the control booth, only about every 35 minutes, which makes me believe every time someone was bumped out of the control booth, the first person that came in was the next person to actually do a spiel so they could remember. And then they forgot to do them. Um, And this, it, the ride did reopen later that first time we tried to. It didn't reopen until like nine o'clock at night, no, which no. was three hours after we left. Yeah. And we should say they did finally ask guests to leave yes. the queue well, at, at 630. Yeah. yeah. No, I was getting there. So we're standing there waiting. The the cast or the now you got me saying it. Team, the team members team. that were standing in the area that we were right before load, they were all communicating with guests saying, you know, how's everyone doing? You're yeah. OK. Um, you know, anyone who asks, is it going to be a while? They were given the standards bill. Now, I'm not quite sure how long it's going to be. Um, and that's that's protocol. So I understand that. The problem was it got to a point where they knew that the ride wasn't going to reopen. Right. They they got to it where they knew they couldn't have it back open, but they were just letting people sit in the attraction you know, and wait for when there was no there was zero chance it was going to open back up immediately for them. If it was going to open at all that night, that would be a long shot. And it did. So they made it happen. But there was there was knowledge. I'm not going to say how I know there was knowledge of it. There was knowledge that that was not going to reopen. And while while I know I know all the parties in the back of house were communicating and they had to have known. But someone someone on the operation side of it, not the technical side of it, but the operation side, someone made the decision, okay, we're not going to drop the queue. Well, and, and that's the thing that's infuriating to me is that it's not even just I'm, I, I understand the downs and then the 30 minutes that was down before or whatever. That's fine. I, you know, I don't I there is a rule of thumb, at least I know at Disney for when an attraction goes down how long it will be down for decides when you dump the queue or not, you know? And I, I, where I worked, it was 30 minutes. So if you, the attraction wasn't going to open within 30 minutes, the queue gets dumped, you know, but you spiel every like five to 10 minutes or whatever. But it, it just like, to me, it's basically, we were in that one room for over two hours without moving. And if there was any knowledge that it wasn't going to happen after 45 minutes and been, been like, we have no further developments, they should have been like, you know what? These people's time is worth more than this. For us, we're annual pass holders and it's a different story, I guess. But however, every, anybody who paid to be there, and I don't care if you only paid there be, to be there to do that one thing, it still said, we don't value your time. No. No, it, it, that's it. And I, so with Universal, it's at the very least when there's technical issues, most of the time, if there are technical issues, it's not going to be that long. Um, you're talking that the amount of time that it was down, you're talking 
that's track evac level. So, and if they would have, if there would have been guests on the ride, and mm-hmm. there might have been, and we just didn't know about it, if they would have been on that long, they would have done a track evac. And as soon as you do a track evac, that is when you get health services over, you get guest uh, guest services over, and you dump the queue. That's you do it at that point. So with the how long the attraction was down, hopefully they they didn't have to do an evac that day and all the guests were already off the ride and then it had the technical issues and it was just down. But like I said, if they would have had to do an evac, they would have had to dump the queue. I think when they are doing evacs, they're not dumping the queue because they don't want to give away the Ruby cards. And that could be me completely saying that. But every time I, they I, give I, away I the Ruby cards, yeah. every time they give it away and they, they are giving people a pass to get back to Express. So then the ride's going to reopen. They're going to open up that queue. People are going to flood in who don't have the Ruby Pass. And then you're going to get all these Ruby Passes coming back that are then trying to get on. And when you're talking about a queue that is entirely packed to the brim, having to give them all one, if they all come back at the same time, then they're going to. So, But here's here's the here's the error in their, mis- their mistake, too. So I left while we were in that room before we'd moved for a little bit, and they were still loading this queue. That So yeah. th- right, that right there is is idiotic to me, uh, basically, because if you even have a little bit of trouble, at least stop loading the queue, because now you're just creating a, a larger amount of people that have a bigger problem. And it just... It, it was like, why... If you know, why not just cut the queue after when it reaches the three hour wait or something like that and let it go down a little bit and be like, all right, it's been functioning for a while. Let's reopen the queue and let some more people in. And the managers deal with that people out front for that. Like, I, I that's the thing that just it, it bugged me so much. Like, it's just, it's not I, I don't want to offend anyone. I, I know plenty of people who work there. And I think I even know the managers who are on the attraction. I'm not trying to offend anyone when I say no. It. Something is being, in terms of when they are having issues with this attraction, someone is not doing their job. Guests and should I never don't... be allowed to sit in a queue without movement for two hours, ever. Anywhere, any theme no. park, anywhere. No. That's what I'm saying. I'm, not, I'm just putting that out there. And I'm not saying that Universal has a history of this or anything like that either. I don't mean to sound overly negative. No, it's, it's a bad situation. It's not either. overly negative. It's I, w- I was saying it that night. Um, I said it to you at one point in time. I would have been embarrassed if I was if I was either the supervisor of that attraction, even the attraction lead, knowing that I was leaving guests sitting there with no hope because we don't want to give out these Ruby passes that we think maybe the attraction will reopen at some point in time. Like they are they and again, I'm not, I'm not blaming the technicians. They're trying to maintain this ride that a lot of people have been criticizing that it wasn't built well to begin with and that it naturally has issues. And I don't blame the techs for not being able to put a Band-Aid on everything and fix it. They can only do so much during regular operating hours. That's why they need the extended time yeah. at night causing the delayed openings that are happening right now for a little while. But at the end of the day, it comes down on the operations side with the frontline team members being given being given permission to make these choices when their supervisors and managers aren't going to step up and actually do it and make these decisions. It was it was completely improperly handled and on all fronts. And I'm I don't know who's to blame on that. I in it terms could be of like even a higher name, up than just the managers at the attraction. Yeah. My my issue at the attraction was the guest service recovery yeah. thing. But I, I agree with you. I mean I, I really don't think they should be letting as many people in the queue until it runs better. Yeah. Like just keep cutting the queue off and then be like, well check back later, it might reopen the same way an attraction does when they, it goes down. They don't even have to do that. They just have to have the balls to give out these passes when they need to dump the queue because it's not going to open up and they need people out of there they need to just have the balls to give it out and And say you know what we screwed up here you go they wouldn't even have had to do this if they had had a technical rehearsal that's the other part of it too you know that's the because when it's in technical rehearsal you're like well it's not really open (laughs) yeah no (laughs) you know that's it but you know what they set a deadline and they work their butts off to hit it and it's still having issues and you can you can blame them on all fronts on that. I don't think it's ready still. And I said that day that that happened, that if they're going to continually have this problem, they need to just take the ride down until it's ready. I think, and, I, and I think the ultimate frustration here for me, for it, it might be similar for you as well, but it's that, you know, 
when it comes to people that are Universal's like number one champions, it's we both love it. You know, I have been going there since I was a child, since it opened, and and it for me is the first place I was brave enough to go on these attractions, and it's come such a long way, even just in the last like ten years, and it's one of those where it's like this little misstep can be such a massive step yep. backwards for people who are finally taking that risk going outside of their comfort out of the Disney bubble or even just making the risk of being like pack it up kids we're going to Universal you know so it breaks my heart a little bit on multiple areas for that and I don't want to be like oh I'm not going to continue to be a champion for Universal but it's just as hard when you're the person who puts your reputation or your neck on the line for you know I feel like we're friends Universal and I and I wanted my friend to do well and you know, when it didn't do well, I'm like, I feel bad for it. You know, yeah. no, I, I, I don't, I feel like just based on what I'm seeing from people the past couple of days. And like when I open up the app and see it, it seems to be cooperating more and more that's as good. every day is going on. And if it's cooperating to me, that's fine. But if it goes yeah. through another stretch where, where it's breaking down and they need to be down for five hours at a time and they're having these issues, just shut the ride down. Admit it's not ready. Apologize to anyone who did plan their vacations around coming here for this because you set an opening date and you hit it, but you couldn't maintain it. Apologize up front. Give yeah. them what it, you need to in order to coast it over. Not every single person is going to come here and throw up a fight about it because there are still many amazing tractions. But well, for that it, small group of people who yeah. is saying... I literally only came here for this and it's not working. Make up for it in that way. Make up for it however you do, uh, however you have to, to to get the job done. Fix the ride. Make sure it's operating at a level that it should be. And then say, here we go. Yeah, again. And that's not that that has happened in theme park history before too. test track opened and had to close immediately for two years. So you wouldn't be the first attraction for that to happen with, you know? So anybody out there who's like, this would never happen at Disney. Well, I hate to break it to you. It did happen at Disney. They built a building that couldn't sustain the actual force of their attraction. So this, you know, I'm not saying this is a similar situation, but you know, just remember things happen. Yeah. So, uh, but Next time we got on, no issues. Um, so, with our red, our Ruby Pass. So I will say that eventually they did give it to us. Uh, they gave it to Rhino uh, for for his. Um, yeah, they did reach out to. Me. So yeah. originally on Twitter, the their response was not very nice. Um, yeah. it, it felt very. I don't know who was handling it that day, but they were copy and pasting something. They all they said was sorry for the delay, and I was like, oh. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and it, so clearly the message of what I was complaining about was missed. It wasn't the attraction. So, but then they reached the next morning I woke up, I had a message. They were very, they were very kind about it. So. Yeah. Nope. So uh, that's how we were able to get back on it quickly and experience it. And I, I, if we would have still made it on after six hours of all that weight, if they would have miraculous, yeah, I would have been happy. It was just that it was really the lack of communication. The fact that, there was no they didn't empty the queue they didn't have they didn't have some supervisor level or above plus guest services in the queue actually talking to people explaining explaining that like you know it's we're hoping if not this is what's going to happen they should have had stuff like that happening bring us and a then, snack or something yeah. maybe and then know. also um it, it like the fact i it, it was just a mess yeah. it was just a mess but if it would have worked it all would have been fine, but and it did eventually. But um, that's that's our review right now. It's go in with go in expecting the ride to be amazing because the ride is amazing. Yeah, your experience on the actual attraction will be yeah. it'll be awesome. But until everything is working smoothly, and by the time this is released, they could say, "Nope, we fixed all the issues, and it's going to run smoothly from now on, and this won't matter." Uh, good, good for that. If that's the case, then it's good. But while it's still having technical Don't issues, plan around it. Yeah. Just th consider it a happy coincidence yeah. if it's working. While while it's still having technical issues, just go in expecting the queue experience to be awful, and <laughs> then hopefully being pleasantly surprised by it. And remember, you have to leave your backpack out front before you even enter the queue. So don't be thinking you're gonna be like smart and bring a Nintendo Switch or anything yeah. like that. Just Sorry. make sure you have your cell phone and then uh, a charging. 
backpack that's small enough to fit in your pocket. Yeah. And uh, if again, you can always leave the queue if it's long and it gets slowed down. So uh, if you're expecting that, you know, maybe maybe if you're like a lady who doesn't have a very you have very tight pockets, not the extra room to stick them in. I know gentlemen can also I have very, that too. Very t- so, tiny pockets. Yeah, I've seen you fit a lot in your pocket. So <laughs> and uh, but yeah, you can always you can always bounce out real quick if there's like a breakdown at some point in time and you have a you get backed up and you need to run something back out to the locker but uh you know don't don't bank on it but it's probably going to be an option available so uh that's actually you know we i know we normally answer the questions at the end of this episode but uh we've already run really long on it because we had a lot to talk about there between uh hhn and then our Hagrid's review so uh we're just going to end the episode here and we'll be we'll answer questions not next week actually either because next week we'll have our review of universal's endless summer surfside and and sweets for you and then mm. probably the week after that we'll have our big fire review for you <laughs> Ooh. We're just gonna. We we've got plans, man. We've got plans. So uh, th- that's gonna do it for this episode, though. Uh, of course, if you need more information, disunplug.com, uh, and you can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram uh, as as you can, and then you will podcast at disunplug.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead, subscribe, hit that bell button so you get notified when we have new videos. Leave us comments down below. Hit that thumbs up or thumbs down. And if you're listening to this on iTunes or any other place where you can subscribe to our audio feed do so and if you can leave us ratings and reviews on those uh that would also be awesome so that's going to do it for this episode we'll see you again next week with another episode but until then remember we still have not changed the